sit in a different spot in church. <laughs> yep. And there are times it feels a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? Who, is, who are those people sitting in my spot? And why did they take it? Didn't they know that I usually sit there? But then when you sit from a different vantage point, you see different things. You see a stained glass window that you perhaps never noticed before. Or, oh, you can smell the furnace has been turned on and maybe you didn't smell that before. Or you can see from here that David got an outstanding haircut. And I don't know if I would have not seen that before. But we've all been in those moments where we've been in a place that we didn't necessarily know. It was really unfamiliar. And trying to make sense of, okay, why am I in this spot in this moment? And is it okay? And will I be okay? And what do I need to be okay? So you find, those, you find those things, whether it's family, whether it's hope in God, whether you take that moment to fidget with something, there's something that you turn to to give you an element of comfort. Sometimes when you see food, I know I'll gravitate to the food table because at least then you can hold the plate of food and act like you're really busy eating something or drinking something. And then that becomes the conversational piece, right? When somebody comes up to you, well, what do you think about that appetizer? Oh, it's great, and it's really not. But it gives you something to hold on to, to create comfort, to get us connected, to get us to that place where we can actually be together and not feel quite so unfamiliar. Finding yourself in a different spot, physically, mentally, emotionally, almost feels a bit exilic. On a journey in a foreign land, finding oneself in exile can be traumatic, exhausting, frightening, extremely vulnerable, and even a bit exciting. I think often of the people of Ukraine in this time, in being forced out from their homes, from their jobs, their town squares and their favorite coffee shops and restaurants, the favorite places that for no reason they've been pushed out of, simply by an aggressor that wants place and space and power. How do we find the resilience to move forward when living in exile? Is it even possible? The people of Judah became refugees of the Babylonian Empire and were exiled to Babylon under the leadership of King Nebuchadnezzar. They had little choice. Their way of living was turned upside down, and whether they wanted to or not, these exiled people learned what they were made of and made of while they were traveling to Babylon and established themselves in a new land. Jeremiah writes to these weary people. To, step up, to settle, and to find shalom. It is God's way that they act like settlers and not short-term tourists, despite some of the false prophets who are promising that this time in exile would be short. This is also the only place in the Old Testament with an explicit command to pray for enemies and unbelievers. See the welfare of the city where I have sent you, Pray to God on its behalf, for its welfare you will find your welfare. Jeremiah leans into God's simple instructions to build, to plant, to live, to pray, and to seek, to endure. Simple instructions, perhaps too simple. And yet these instructions require a kind of trust and faith that believes that God can find a way out of no way. These very active verbs were spoken to a people who very much are living in the past. Remember when we used to do it this way? Remember when we would gather in this space? Do, re do you remember this and that? Jeremiah is trying to move the people forward out of this reminiscent stage and into the present, which will then point to a future. 
Professor Sonny Susie Park writes, quote, by telling a community that had been dispersed and displaced that it ought to try to live a good life. God is not simply requesting a lifestyle shift, but a radical adjustment of their theology. By telling the exiled Israelites to build houses, go to work, marry and pray for their new communities, God is in fact telling the Israelites to resist the allure of succumbing to their feelings of despair, dismay, depression, and numbness, to make the best of a bad situation, to try to move forward and survive. Jeremiah, in essence, is calling on the exiled Israelites to sustain their faith in God. End quote. This passage evokes questions for us to consider, especially when we see things that tend to repeat themselves, aggressors seeking control of land and economies in order to war over others that seem less worthy. Why, even in today's standards, does this still continue? Jeremiah lived between 650 to 570 BCE, before Conqueror, before Jesus. He was deeply prophetic, especially for the last 30 years of his life. People cringed when he spoke. It was a message that often was not welcome. And then when one listened carefully, there was elements of truth and hope. Yet the questions remain, as Professor Park points out, quote, in what ways has the church faced situations of injustice, chaos, and horror with passivity and hopelessness? When and in what ways have we equated acceptance with doing nothing and feeling nothing? How might we both accept our place in an unjust world and also sustain our belief that the arc of the moral universe does indeed bend towards justice." End quote. And then on the flip side, we also need to be mindful of the ways the church has been the oppressor. How has the church exiled others? Langston Hughes in his poem, Let America Be America Again, incorporates a refrain of, oh, ne it'll never, it never was America to me, as there have been communities that have long experienced exile as a result of gender, skin color, belief system, or sexual orientation. It continues today, and we keep reading these scriptures to remind us and to hold us accountable <laughs> to the intended and unintended costs of exile and what this does to God's people. What happens in one small section of the world has ramifications to other sections of the world. We are connected. And yet Jeremiah continues to tell us to push for shalom, to build Plant and to seek and to pray. We are called to move forward, whether we're ready or not. May it be so.